This summer we've been taking a road trip, a spiritual road trip, seeking to follow Jesus and to understand better what it means to be a follower of Christ, a disciple. So we've been journeying and experiencing different things along the way, and today we take a detour to learn a very important lesson about a subject that we need to know about. It's about prayer. I'd like for you to share with me in a scripture that is found in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke in the first 13 verses. The scripture will be on the screen, but if you would like to use the Bible that is in the seat rack in front of you, it's on page 792, 792 in that pew Bible. And by the way, if you do not have a Bible and you would like to have one free of charge, we would invite you to take that Bible with you, and it will be yours. Let's stand together as we hear these words from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus told them, when you pray, say, Father, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who has wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation. He also said to them, Imagine that one of you has a friend and you go to that friend in the middle of the night. Imagine saying, Friend, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. Imagine further that he answers from within the house, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I assure you, even if he wouldn't get up and help because of his friendship, he will get up and give his friend whatever he needs because of his friend's brashness. And I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. Whoever seeks finds. To everyone who knocks, the door is opened. Which father among you would give a snake to your child if the child asked for a fish? If a child asked for an egg, what father would give the child a scorpion? If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And please be seated. The disciple asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. What a strange request. Jesus didn't invent prayer. Prayer had been going on since the beginning of time. The disciples knew about prayer. They had heard people pray. Jesus grew up hearing the prayers of the elders, the rabbis, in the synagogue. So it was a culture that was not unfamiliar with praying. But there was something about the prayers of Jesus that were different. Lord, teach us to pray. It's interesting to me that they did not say, Lord, we've heard you teach and preach. Could you teach us to be good public speakers? They knew something about this radical theology that Jesus possessed. They didn't say, Lord, 
teach us good theology. Teach us hermeneutics. Teach us a system of beliefs. That was not the request. Lord, teach us how to win friends and influence people. Lord, teach us how to heal. There are so many things they could have asked of Jesus. But Lord, teach us to pray. So what do you know about prayer? Do you pray? Do you? Now I'll be honest with you this morning. If there is anything that makes me nervous or makes me feel woefully inadequate, it is being called upon to pray. Because each time... I'm called upon to pray, I feel like a small child. Not an ordained minister, not a seminary graduate. I feel like a child. I feel like I'm in elementary school, in the school of prayer that there is so much I need to know and learn and do. Does it make you feel that way? And so my prayer is, Lord, teach me to pray. Not just teach me how to pray. Not just teach me when to pray, but Lord, teach me to pray. A few years ago, I was asked to lead a study on Wednesday evenings in the chapel, the study would last about six or eight weeks, on the subject of prayer, and I don't know what possessed me to agree to that. I don't know why in the world I would take on that assignment. But the resource I used is a book that has always spoken to me on this subject. It's been written by Richard Foster, and it's entitled prayer. The subtitle is Finding the Heart's True Home. And I have read and reread this book many times, and if you look at it, you'll find uh, I can't read a book without underlining and writing in the margins and just, just destroying it. I mean, I just mark it up terribly. I can't read any other way. So I was beginning the first session of this study on prayer, and I was nervous because I thought, who am I to be talking to anybody about prayer? What do I know about prayer? And so I began with one of those icebreaker rhetorical questions, and it was intended to be a rhetorical question. Not everybody got the point, though. So I said, why is prayer so difficult? And a man, an elderly man, very well known in the church, respected in the community, raised his hand and interrupted me before I could go on. I mean, I had notes. I was prepared. And so I called upon him. And he said, he cleared his throat, well, I'll tell you why. Because it is an exercise in futility. It's a waste of time. That was not what I was expecting. It was not anywhere in my notes. We had not planned on that. And I wasn't alone in feeling that way because there were about 25 or 30 people in the chapel that night and collectively they sucked the air right out of the room. I mean, it was just one collective gasp. (gasps) How could anybody dare to say such a thing in church? Think it in private, keep it to yourself. But he didn't do that. And so I switched into counselor mode and I said, well, let's talk about that. Tell me why you feel that way. I was was trying to buy some time. That's what I was doing. I said, tell me why you feel that way. 
And so he said, well, it's, it's a waste of time because we pray and we pray and our prayers aren't answered. We don't get what we pray for, so it's a waste of time. And suddenly this answer came to me, and it must have been from God. The Holy Spirit gave me this answer. And I said, I agree. I agree. If your definition of prayer is that we present God with a grocery list of all that we need, when we need it, how we need it, and we expect God to give us what we ask for, when and how we ask for it. If that is your definition of prayer, then I agree with you, sir. I said, I think it is a waste of time. But I said, what if our definition of prayer changes? And we look at prayer not as demanding from God what we want because we know what we want. We know what is best for us. What if prayer is not that at all? What if prayer is really communion with God? What if prayer is not a monologue but a dialogue in which we honestly express to God what we feel and think and what we think we need and we take time to listen to God and for God to speak to us and change us? What if prayer is not about our circumstances being changed but about us being changed. What if that's what it's about? How do you define prayer? Now, I've heard some wonderful prayers in my lifetime, and I prefer short, to the point, honest prayers. I have a brother who's five years younger than I am, and that kid, when he was a little boy, he knew how to pray. We always had this habit of praying before the meal at the dinner table, and he loved to pray. That kid could pray until the food turned cold. I mean, he would pray. his prayers were endless. I was sitting there just about to die waiting for the amen. You know, And if I could have reached him to have pinched him or hit him during the prayer, I would have. He would pray for everything he could think of. Big elephants, tiny ants, squirrels in the trees, birds. He prayed for everything because I think he knew that he was frustrating me. He was doing it on purpose. And he would pray for everyone he could think of. The God bless this person and that person never ended. The only exception to that was if you had done something to make him mad or he was angry with you, you were omitted from the prayer as punishment. So often there was not a God bless Michael. I didn't merit being prayed for. You hear what I'm saying? That kid knew how to pray. Anne Lamott is a wonderful Christian writer who thinks outside the box and writes outside the box and is painfully honest at times. She wrote a book on prayer, and it was entitled with her three most frequently offered prayers. One-word prayers. You got to love a one word prayer, don't you? Isn't that a great prayer? Well, Anne Lamott's three one word prayers that she says she has prayed throughout her lifetime are these three prayers Help, Thanks, and Wow. Have you ever prayed those three prayers? 
Maybe you uh, felt the need to add a few more words to them, but you don't have to. Anne Lamott taught, taught us that those are three great prayers. There are times when we don't know what to do or who to be, or, and all we can do is turn to God and say, Help, help, help me, help them, help our world, help God. And God understands. There are times when our hearts are full of gratitude and thankfulness, and it's very appropriate just to say, God, thanks, thanks. Or are times when we see the beauty of God's creation, and we wonder at the generosity of God, the grace of God, and we offer, wow, God, you've wowed me again. I'm overwhelmed. Now, there are times that we don't know for what to pray or how to pray. We don't know the words to use. Our words are just kind of like a jumbled mess of letters and phrases, and we struggle to know how to pray, and that's okay. The Scripture assures us that we're not praying alone, that God's Spirit prays for us and with us, interceding for us and taking our incomplete sentences, our groans, our moans, our tears, our anger, our doubts, our frustrations, and somehow is able to make sense of it. Isn't that wonderful? That God knows what we need, when we need it, how we need it. God knows. Well, Jesus gave to his disciples a model prayer. Now, I'm not sure that Jesus ever intended for believers when they got together to recite this prayer every Sunday, and there's nothing wrong with that. The model prayer that we read from the Gospel of Luke is different from the Lord's Prayer given in Matthew's Gospel. That one is a little more extensive. The wording is different. But the elements are the same. Jesus gave to his disciples a model prayer. Now here's a template for prayer. Here's something you can kind of go by. And it was not like any prayer they had ever heard. It was brief. It was to the point. It was bold. You don't read or hear in this prayer any elaboration, any flowery words or any pleadings. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. Lead us. To the point. What a different prayer Jesus prayed. No wonder the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. But the most outrageous, audacious thing about the prayer of Jesus had to be the way it started with this addressing of God with the term of intimacy. Familial term. Father. Our Father. Divine Parent. Father, Mother, Parent. God who created us, who loves us, who brought us into existence, who is always with us, who cares for us, who knows us better than we know ourselves. Father. I think that got their attention. Jesus was teaching them and us that when we go to God in prayer, when we approach God, we do so as a child of God. Now, there are many people who through the years have become disillusioned with prayer, disappointed with the whole thing, angry at God. They feel that God is a million miles away or God doesn't care, or they feel as that man did in the chapel that Wednesday night, prayer is an exercise in futility. It's a waste of time. So why is it that our prayers aren't always answered? at least the way we want them to be answered. Well, let me offer you three explanations that I've found 
to be true. One is perhaps the prayer isn't right. Maybe we're not praying for what we should be praying for. Maybe we haven't taken time to really surrender our will and get ourselves out of the way. You know, I think the humanity of Jesus was seen in a marvelous way in his prayer in Gethsemane's garden. Do you remember that prayer that he offered with such intensity while the disciples slept? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. The humanness of Jesus did not want the torture, the betrayal, the type of death that was ahead. Let this cup pass from me. But Jesus did not stop there. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus surrendered his will to the will of God. How difficult. The greatest spiritual discipline and exercise we do, I think, is yielding our will to God's. And saying, God, I don't know what I need and what is best for me. Sometimes I think our prayers are not answered the way we want them to because of the timing. The timing isn't right. Maybe what we ask for is correct, but it, we're not ready or it's just the wrong time. You know, we live in a very impatient culture. We're impatient people, aren't we? Now, just confess, most of us are. We like things quickly. A couple of years ago, I was sitting at a red light, traffic light. I don't know why we call them red lights. Sometimes they're green, sometimes they're yellow, but uh, traffic light. I have a friend who has done some research and, and, uh, and made a list of the longest traffic lights in Johnson City. I mean, there are some that just last for eternity, and you don't want to ever be at that intersection because you know what's going to happen. It's going to take forever to change. Well, I was at State of Franklin, and I don't know what the cross street is that uh, goes over to Cheddar's, and uh, the other way it goes up the hill toward Home Depot. What is that street? Greenway? Green Line? People, okay, all right. You know where I'm talking about. You've been there, haven't you? Well, I was sitting there in a long line of traffic, and that light wasn't changing. The other cars were going, but we were not. And I came to the conclusion, uh, it, it's broken. Uh, it, it, just, it, it's, it, it, it will never change. I called 911. I did. <laughs> so help me. I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I called 911. I know I should not have, but I did. To me, it was an emergency, okay? I was about to die. <sighs> I'm sure they've had worse calls than that. I said, you need to get somebody down here, a police officer to direct traffic. What's the matter? I mean, we are backed up. We've been waiting here forever. Well, the 911 dispatcher was very patient, very professional. I was not, but they were. And so I got off the phone, and immediately as soon as I hung up, still huffing and puffing, the light changed. I thought, well, I did it. I showed them, yeah. <laughs> they got right on it, yeah. We're impatient. Sometimes their prayers aren't answered the way we want them to because we need to change. We need to be transformed. You know, the Apostle Paul had some kind of physical, chronic affliction that he prayed would be removed. He called it his thorn in the flesh. It just wouldn't go away. He was persistent. 
but he needed to change. The answer came to him from God, my grace is sufficient. What kind of answer is that? My grace is sufficient. The thorn in the flesh is not going to be removed. You won't be delivered of that. But I'm going to give you strength and grace to bear it and to see you through because my strength is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes we need to change. I do believe that prayer reveals our concept of God. Jesus taught this parable to help his disciples understand that God is not a tyrant, God is not punitive, God is not distant. The key phrase of this parable that Jesus told is captured in three words, how much more? How much more than an earthly parent? a parent who occasionally makes mistakes, who doesn't always know the best. How much more is God willing to hear and give us what we need, not what we want? How much more? Prayer reveals our concept of God. Occasionally somebody comes to me and says, I have begged and begged and begged God. Why? God knows what we need before we ask it. You don't have to beg God. You don't have to wear God down or out. We approach God as a child goes to a parent with love. I believe that prayer is a commitment of our part to not give up on prayer, even when prayer is not answered the way we want it, when we want it, how we want it. St. Augustine said, true prayer is nothing but love. In Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Samuel Coleridge wrote, He prayeth well who loveth well. Prayer is love. It is being loved by God. It is expressing our love for God, our commitment to God. You know, I mentioned to you earlier about this book by Richard Foster on prayer. In this book, he tells the true story of a friend who has a two-year-old son at the time. He said he had his two-year-old son at a shopping mall, and this two-year-old boy was just incorrigible. Two-year-olds are very autonomous, you know. They have their difficult moments, just like we do. This two-year-old son was throwing a fit. He was just fussy. He was irritable. Nothing would satisfy him. This poor father couldn't do anything with him. And finally, in exasperation, he scooped his son up into his arms and held him close to his chest and began to make up a song that he would sing softly in his ear. I mean... It didn't rhyme, it didn't make sense. It was just, he was just walking with his son through that shopping mall, making up this song. I'm your daddy, and you're my son, and I love you, and you're the best boy in the whole world. And just singing and making it up as he went along. And his son quietened down. And he got him out to the car, and he opened the door, and he was getting him in his car seat and buckling him in. And the little boy said, Daddy, sing me that song again. Sing me that song again. And Richard Foster wrote, that's what prayer is like. It is being scooped up in the arms of God and hearing God's love song to us that I'm yours and you are mine and I'm going to take care of you and I love you and you are mine. Lord, teach us to pray. Let's bow our heads together and let's have a time of prayer, shall we?